Hello and welcome to chapter 9.1 from Stevens' Introduction to Statistics, the Think and Do book. In this, our first section on hypothesis tests with two samples, we investigate hypothesis tests for mean differences involving paired data. Very important that, these, that the data comes in pairs. And we'll consider the mean difference. That's what we're, we're doing a test about the mean difference in values between two related populations. Um, the data must come in pairs, and we make a claim about the mean difference. Right. An example will uh, do a good job of illustrating this. So here we have the data for the cholesterol level of, uh, let's see, 10 men diagnosed with high cholesterol. And for each man, there's a before reading and an after reading. So that's our pairs, before and after. And so this represents one pair of data, another pair, and so on and so on. And what we want to do is we want to test a claim about the mean difference. So the difference row creates another sample, but it's the sample of differences. 237 minus 194 gives me 43. 289 minus 240 is 49, and so on. And so what I have then is actually a single sample of paired differences. Right? So this boils down to a single sample hypothesis test, just like chapter 8.3. Just like 8.3. And the data we're working with is this sample here, the sample of differences. Okay, so if you look at this, what you can tell right away is that the mean difference, 32, right here, is uh, certainly greater than zero, right? And we want to know if this is sufficient evidence to support the claim that the mean difference in all men is greater than zero. And since it's 32 and we're comparing it to zero, there's a pretty good chance that we will support that claim. And so we might want to make a stronger claim. We might want to say um, the mean difference in all men is greater than 20. And that's milligrams per deciliter. All right, so that's a stronger statement about the uh, medication, right? And what we will do is we'll calculate a test statistic. It's a t-value, so we'll be using the t-table and decide whether or not there's sufficient uh, data to support our claim. But before we do this example, let's get through a couple of little things, some requirements. Um, the sample observations must come from a simple random sample. And then we either need the sample size to be more than 30, or the population of differences is known to be normally distributed. Now, for demonstration purposes in this text, um, I'll usually be using small samples so that we can sort of visualize them. Um, so we'll often be assuming that the population of differences is known to be normally distributed, even when we're not totally certain on this. Um, so we need one of those two, th or, or both, right? We need at least one of those two to be true. All right, so... We calculate a test statistic. It's a t-score, so we're going to be using the t-table. And our first term there is the d-bar. And that comes from our sample. That is the sample mean difference. Mu sub d is the population mean difference that we're going to assume in the null hypothesis. S sub d is the standard deviation of the sample mean differences. N is the number of pairs. So in that last example, we had 10 men for a total of 20 readings, but they came in pairs, so we only had 10 as our sample size. And the degrees of freedom, since we're going to be using the t-table, this is a t-score after all, the degrees of freedom, just like in chapter 8, is going to be n minus 1. Uh, we also have critical values of t. t sub alpha denotes a critical value in a one-tailed test, and we get plus or minus t sub alpha over 2 for a two-tailed test. So the process is identical to the one-sample test about a mean using the t-distribution. In other words, 
the process is identical to chapter 8.3. Our test statistic is calculated in a slightly different way, um, but that is even the same, it's just different notation. So we need to determine the null and alternate hypothesis. So we start with a claim. We put that in mathematical notation. Then the null hypothesis always has the equal to sign. And mu sub d is the mean of all the sample difference, is the, um, no, the, the mean difference of the population, right? And we get the equal to sign always. And mu naught, mu sub zero, is a number. The alternate hypothesis, you can get a right tail test, a left tail test, or a two tail test with the not equal to sign. We calculate the test statistic with the formula from the last page. And then we decide whether or not to reject the null hypothesis. And again, there are two equivalent methods. We will be focusing on the critical value method because that's easy for us table users to do. And so we will be going to table um, three. That's the T table. It's not on these pages. That's the instructor version. And once we get the critical value, we'll determine the rejection region. And we will reject H0 if the test statistic is in the rejection region as we did all through chapter 8. And the p-value method is good for software users and the, all software will just generate a p-value immediately and that's quite easy because you reject the null hypothesis the p-value is less than alpha where alpha here is the significance level usually 0 0.10, 0 0.05, or 0.01 and then you finish off by making an understandable conclusion about the original claim. So let's take a look at our example here. We have the cholesterol levels for 10 men before and after. We reduce that to a single sample of differences, right? Okay, the manufacturer of the medication claims that on average the medication lowers cholesterol levels in all men who use it based on this sample data. So you want to test the claim that the mean difference in all men is positive or greater than zero. We will assume the population of differences is normally distributed and we'll use a 0.01 significance level. Okay, so our claim is that the mean difference in all men is greater than zero, right? So that's our claim. And the alternate gets the equal to, or sorry, the null, null hypothesis gets the equal to sign, and the alternate gets the um, claim because it can do so and still be different from the null, right? Those two have to be different. Okay, so when you, when you calculate the test statistic using equation 9.1 there, looks like this. And d bar, the sample mean of differences, is right here. That's 32. And mu sub d comes from the null hypothesis. That's zero. S sub d is the standard deviation of the sample mean differences. So that's 15.4 right here. And n is the number of data pairs, which is 10. Right. So when you run that through your calculator, being sure to make sure this fraction on the denominator is in parentheses, I get a 6.57. So that is a pretty big test statistic. And so we have to determine whether or not we reject the null hypothesis. Looking at the size of that test statistic, I suspect we will be rejecting it. But let's do the critical value method. If you put 0.01, that's our significance level, into one tail with nine degrees of freedom, we go back to our t table. Right, so we have one tail 0.01, so we're in this column, with 9 degrees of freedom. So the critical value is 2.821. Right. And that's where this came from, 2.821. Okay, so I didn't, I didn't draw the distributions in these problems because we drew so many of them in the last chapter. I'm hoping you get sort of a feel for them. But if I did... That's very poor distribution, but in any case, it suffices. 
this value right here is 2.821. And the rejection region is everything to the right of 2.821. Right? And so if you look at your test statistic right here, that is certainly deep in the rejection region. So we're going to reject H0. If you have software, you can calculate the p-value, and it's very small. It's 0.000514. Actually, I might have come short on my zeros. It's 0 0.000514. Regardless, it is a lot smaller than alpha, which is, in our case, 0.01. That's the significance level. So either way, you reject the null hypothesis, so that's good. So the sample data supports our claim. Specifically, it supports our claim that the mean difference in all men who use the medication is positive. Or from the perspective of the manufacturer of the medication, if they imply some cause and effect, they will say that on average the medication lowers cholesterol levels in all men. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at example two. So, so by the way, something to notice from example one. This test statistic was huge. Our p-value is tiny. It was way in the rejection region. So we really, we really hit a home run on this one. We're way in the rejection region. So we're going to make a, a stronger claim. Specifically in example two, we're going to claim that it lowers cholesterol in all men by more than 20 milligrams per deciliter. Right? That's going to make our medication sound a lot better, right? Only this time we'll um, change our significance level to 0.05. Right? So the only difference between this and example one is that now I'm claiming that mu sub d, the, the population of differences, the mean from the population of differences, is greater than 20. The null hypothesis gets the equal to sign, alternate supports the claim. So we're right back at that same equation for a test statistic. And the only difference is that mu sub d from the null hypothesis is now 20. So this used to be a 0, now it's a 20. And when we plug that into our calculator, we get 2.46. So this is certainly a closer call. But if we go to our critical value of t, we're now at the 0.05 significance level, one tail, 9 degrees of freedom. Remember, that's n minus 1. And so all we're going to do, we're in the same row, 9 degrees of freedom, but not we're not in the 0.01 significance level. We are now in the 0.05 significance level. So we're in this column. So our critical value becomes 1.833. So, that's what we have here. T sub alpha, the critical value is 1.833. And again, I didn't draw the distribution, but if we did, we would get 1.833, say right here. Everything to the right would be in the rejection region. And the test statistic, 2.46, is in the rejection region. So we reject the null hypothesis. If you have software, you can calculate the p-value, which comes out to be about 0 0.018, which is smaller than alpha, which in this case is 0 0.05. Remember, we changed that. So again, we reject the null hypothesis. Either method works. Um, so we reject the null hypothesis. The data supports the claim. Specifically, it supports the claim that on average the medication lowers cholesterol in all men by more than 20 milligrams per deciliter. So we've supported a stronger claim just by changing the presumed um, difference. Um, but notice we did that at the 0.05 significance level. If we went that back down to the 0.01 significance level, if we look at example 2 and change the significance level to 0.01, so that's this previous example, only instead of 0.05 here, it's going to be 0.01. Can we support the claim at that significance level? Well, it's going to change our um, critical value. Right? And we found the critical value in example 1 
at the top of this page, the critical value is 2.821 at the 0.01 significance level. So if you look at that, 2.821, it's a little further out here, 2.821, and the test statistic from example 2 was what, 2.46. That is not in the rejection region, it's over here, right? Well, to the right a little bit, say over there. All right, so it is no longer in the rejection region, so we won't be able to reject the null hypothesis. And we therefore don't have enough data to support our claim. Um, so the significance level can certainly change um, your conclusion. And so that wraps up chapter 9.1, the first chapter in two sample hypothesis tests, but really we reduced it down to a um, single sample hypothesis test by looking at the collection of differences. In chapter 9.2, we will be legitimately looking at two independent samples, and we'll be, be, we will be comparing the means between those two samples, and the calculations get a little trickier. But for now, things are looking pretty good, so I'll see you, or you will hear from me, I guess, in chapter 9.2. Bye.